Hey there team and welcome to another update on Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. Today is Thursday, February 27th and it's been about a week since we looked at Iceland. We did a drone flight with Nature Eye and Johan over some of the fresh lava fields there and I thought we should circle back and just check out the latest data and such. Uh, we have a system that's really primed for an eruption at any point now like it you know minutes hours week days possibly weeks um but seems to be right there in terms of having the storage system completely filled and pressurized and now it's just the the waiting uh which is always the hardest part so you can see here from the live cam kind of a gray day there a little hard to see with the visibility but you can see some of the outgassing and steam coming out of the lava field here we're looking northeast from Thorpur out towards the Sundakur uh, crater row here and beyond to Fagradalsfjall. The cone over here is the site of the 2021 eruption. And so that's what our webcam is showing us now. Uh, this would be a good place to keep kind of checking back if you want to see what's going on in Iceland. Obviously, the weather will kind of dictate what you can see on the live webcam, but these webcams might be our first uh, indication that the eruption has begun. We'll have to see. The Met Office came out with a new update uh, two days ago, so I thought we'd go over this. It's pretty brief and not a lot of new information, but obviously increased risk of volcanic eruption. Uh, the uplift continues, but is slowed down. Uh, we'll look at that here in a little bit as, as well when we get to the GPS data. Amount of magma that is accumulated under Svartsengi is greater than it was before the, the last eruption, which was the November 20th eruption. Uh, so their estimated volume of magma is actually larger than the what we had in the ground prior to the November 20th eruption. So very much a, a system that's ready to go. Now, you can sometimes get larger storage zones with each successive eruption because as you bring in more magma, uh, you stretch the system uh, with ground deformation, you possibly in the subsurface or are melting and incorporating rocks in that sort of lattice system. And so it stands to reason that we're probably getting a larger storage zone in the subsurface. So that might also account for the, um, you know, that magma actually being greater than it was before. It's not that the, the same capacity, the capacity changes to some degree between each eruptive events. Uh, short notice before the eruption that we've talked about that before. Uh, most likely area is this area we've been looking at where we've seen most of the prior eruptions between Sundakur and Stora Stogafelt. Um, that might, they might mean actually there's Silingerfelt, um, that area just to the east of the power plant. Um, yeah, and they're seeing a slight uptick in, in seismic activity. And so we'll see how that looks moving forward. But a very brief update from the Met Office there, I think just kind of monitoring the situation and waiting to see how this all plays out. Uh, the earthquakes, of course, might be helpful as we go get closer to the time of eruption. This whole cluster over here is over in the uh, Krishevik system, unrelated to the volcanic activity and the magma over here near Grindavik. Looks like in the last 24 hours, let's go ahead and bump that to all earthquakes. We've had three, really, so three fairly small quakes there and you know we expect to see more of an uptick in quakes right before the eruption but not much and i want to show you exactly what that looks like here you know so let's let's do a quick review of what we saw with the the seismicity prior to the last two eruptions so here's what we're seeing right now uh, over the last week right so just you know a small cluster maybe a dozen or so earthquakes northeast of grindavik right in that zone where we expect the eruption to begin more or less due east of the Blue Lagoon and the power plant. But I thought it would be a fun exercise to also look at uh, the last eruption, was, which was November 20th, which occurred in this area and had very little uh, seismic signature to it prior to eruption. So there wasn't a lot of earthquakes leading up to that eruption. So here is the cluster of earthquakes from November 19th to the 21st. So uh, the day prior and the day after just tried to give it a good range of dates there to encapsulate all of them. So there you can see, you know, that's, you know, definitely more than what we're seeing now, but not a huge uptick in terms of magnitude or frequency, but we can see that sort of tight um, clustering of the quakes between uh, Silingerfelt here and Stodastogafelt here. This is the area where we expect the eruption. So there's the November 20th um, 
seismic pattern. And then if you remember the eruption before that, August 22nd, that was further north. And because that was further north and a bit outside the normal zone where we'd seen eruptions, that no, that August 22nd eruption um, involved a lot more seismicity, a lot more earthquakes, and the necessity to break rock in order to move that magma through the subsurface and have it erupt there. So I also have here um, the seismic pattern for that event. So notice here, this is uh, August 21st to August 23rd of last year. So here's uh, Seelingerfeld, Stora Sogefeld. This is the area where we've seen most of the eruptions take place. But notice the the much more pronounced, um, cluster, not just clustering, there's some diffuse earthquakes out here too, but larger magnitude quakes uh, and many more of the quakes. So just a, a greater number of quakes overall. So again, just kind of quick review. The last week near uh, Grindavik, what it looked like from the last eruption, okay, not a lot of large quakes and not a huge number of them, uh, and then what we saw there. So that might might help you as an indicator as we look forward. You know, where will the earthquakes, where will the eruption occur? If it's likely to occur in that place we're sort of predicting, then we would expect to see something like the November 20th pattern of earthquakes. If it's going to occur further to the north or possibly further to the south, um, we would expect to see, you know, a much more um, pronounced pattern of earthquake activity. So I thought that would just be a fun little review to kind of take you back through that. Let's look at the GPS data here, which has a couple interesting things. And I've had at least one or two viewers uh, send me this with some questions. So here's uh, Svartsengi, and here's the uplift coming out of, you know, the November eruption doesn't even plot up on here anymore because it was you know almost three months ago uh, and then you can see the last little bit of data here does show a little bit of a decrease in the earthquake in the uplift so you can see it kind of dropping a little bit but again a few data points does not a trend make and so we've actually seen this before if you look right here i guess this is towards late january there was a little lull where it dropped down a little bit but then it picked back up uh, you might find some other little kind of lulls and perturbations in here as well. So uh, the fact that a few of these have dropped down, I don't think is alarming at all. It might be that um, we, again, just attack capacity. It could be pressurization. It could be a lot of things that um, that go into this here. So just, just this little lull here, I don't think is indicative of anything significant at this point. We know the system is has reached the level where an eruption is likely. A couple of the other ones show the same thing, but um, here's Elvorp, which also shows the same sort of trend, just the last you know five or six data points trending downward a little bit. Um, but we've seen that before. And remember, we have error bars here as well. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, okay, just some news items here to round out this, this somewhat short eruption um this one's kind of fun and as always thanks to amanda joe for sending me some of these articles she was able to find so basically this article goes into the fact that we're looking at the longest pause between eruptions in this area since the whole series began in december of 2023 so we're looking at over 80 days uh, this article's a couple days old so they say 79 days so it's a couple days beyond that um and they have Quotes here from Benedict Ulfigsen from the Met Office. Um, they've got the graph there. He says, we're looking at a volume now that's comparable to the last eruption. I would think at this point, we're expecting a comparable eruption rather than something bigger. As it drags on, maybe we can expect uh, a bigger eruption. So um, he also goes on to say, we're still expecting an eruption anytime. Given that the seismic activity is increasing, we have to be on our toes. This tells us there's increased tension in the crust, probably caused by magma. This should be an indication that magma is starting to erupt. Um, so it does, you know, they, they do mention that the, you know, it's a similar volume, but slower influx. So one interpretation of the data is that the magma ascending into the system has slowed a little bit. The rate of magma addition into the storage zone has, has dissipated to some degree over what we saw previously. And that's a very valid um, interpretation if you, you know, assume that the magma storage zone has more or less sort of a, a finite capacity, or it could be that we have more space in the storage zone, so where there's actually more space for the magma to go, 
uh, we have a similar influx of magma, but if there's more places for that magma to infiltrate and, and, and inject itself into the rocks, then you would expect to have longer pauses between those eruptive events. So those are just two possible interpretations based on some of the data there. A little, a couple more news stories. This one's from a few days ago, the 21st, but apparently they did kind of a text alert to folks in, uh, everyone with cell phones in the Grindavik Svartsingi area, um, just warning them about the dangers of being in the area. Um, probably just trying to, probably is a bit of a, a drill, if you will, to you know, make sure that that system was in place. So, uh, but very good that they're thinking of um, ways to alert the public and public safety and kind of getting ahead of this thing as best they can because it's very likely that this event uh, escalates quickly from you know a few indicators like seismicity or the borehole pressure changes at Svartsengi to a full-blown eruption. It might be just a matter of tens of minutes, uh, maybe a few hours at the most. Um, this article here in Grindavik, they have begun... Uh, dismantling some of the homes that were irreparably damaged by some of the earthquake activity over the last year and a half. Um, the, uh, the um, what was it? The, uh, oh, the uh, senior citizens facility that was really badly damaged. I think some of them had to, some of these buildings had to be demolished. Um, and so they're kind of working on that and, and working on, you know, here it is. Let's see, uh, extension. Uh, yeah, so just looking at those buildings that they have to kind of demolish and, and, and take out in Grindavik, which is kind of sad. Remember, a lot of the homes, too, have been sold by the residents back to the government. And then finally, um, this is the borehole, or maybe one of the boreholes, but I think it's, I, can, I don't know if it's one or more boreholes at Svartsengi that provides the information that an eruption may be a occurring and so this is borehole number 12 and they use the pressure readings from this borehole these have proven to be a pretty good indicator that magma is on its way through the system up towards the surface and that can give them a little bit of warning time and uh, this cool innovation apparently was nominated for uh, some type of an award here um, which is kind of great so um, yeah, borehole detection. What I'd like to know about this this specific borehole and really all the boreholes, I, I thought I had access to the, some of the well logs and the information, uh, but I couldn't find those again. But I'd like to know if this borehole is vertical, which it may be, or if it's an angled borehole. And if it's an angled borehole, I'd like to know, you know what direction it was drilled in. I know how long it is. I think it's uh, it even says so here. Um, well, the pressure sensors are at 850 meters, but I think it's actually longer than that. Um, I have that somewhere. But anyway, some interesting information there. Kind of a cool um, story and a, an interesting way in which you know a new innovation or technological technique was used in this case with some of the eruptions we've had in the area. So that's my update for today, team. Uh, we'll keep you posted as things go on in the area around Iceland. Uh, keep watching the webcams, looking at the data, and we'll just kind of wait and see, but uh, looks looks ready to go. Just no one knows exactly when the eruption will begin. So, but that's, this is kind of the, the fun part, I think, is just looking at the data and, and trying to see when those signals come in just before the eruption. So thanks for your time. Thanks for your support of the channel, and we'll see you next time. Take care.